Okay. Um, so it's three o'clock. How are you? You good? Just starting to regret the last drink yesterday. That's always what happens at this time of day. Um, so welcome. Um, my name is uh, Johan Öbrink. Um, I thought the best way to present myself would probably be my Twitter bio. Um, I work at a company called iTeam. Uh, it's a Swedish-based consultancy which uh, helps digitalize our customers using strategy, code, and culture. I won't get any more into that, but you can ask me later if you want to. Um, I live in a place called Hornsbergstrand, which is in the center of Stockholm. So this is just outside my door, which is amazing. Uh, when I'm not coding or speaking, I do a lot of stuff. I do a lot of skiing, biking, swimming, running, and also I just took up um, self-defense in the form of Krav Maga, which is a lot of fun. Um, I'm also a really diehard YouTube addict, so I watch a lot of StarCraft. I play Zerg, by the way. Uh, a lot of channels with political comedy, scientific nerdery, and all kinds of extreme overthinking of movies and overanalyzing movies. Um, I'm also the sort of Swedish go-to guy now for, for television when it comes to commenting on technical developments, which basically means every epic fail. That's the only time they call me. It's like when there is a data leak or, or uh, election meddling or the Momo challenge, um, I go there. And in terms of my age, I will just tell you that these were my first computers, so you can probably infer from that. Um, so, what we're going to talk about is the future, right? It's quite a big topic, uh, but we're going to specify on, what we're like focusing on the, the direction that we're going and how to navigate there. And it's a really good thing when you're trying to navigate to know where you're going. And since we don't know that, we can only infer it from other stuff, uh, it's always a good thing to start looking at what's happened thus far, and then see if we can extrapolate from there. And as far as I see it, we've been through, um, we're, we're going through three major shifts at the moment. And I'll go through them one by one and then try to get, give you some like tips and pointers on how you can uh, cope with these changes. So let's look at the first one, the technological revolutions that we've gone through. Uh, so. There's been a number of them. Uh, the first one uh, was around 1760, was the first industrial revolution. That's when we got the mechanical production, we got railroads, we got steam power. Uh, the second one in 1870, the second industrial revolution was largely centered around mass production. We got electrical power and the assembly line. Uh, then sometime around 1969, uh, we entered the third re industrial revolution, what's also called the first digital revolution. That's when we get automated production, we get electronics, we get computers. And at the moment, most people agree that we are in some sort of revolution. Um, but the problem is, what is it? What should we call it? Is this the, uh, is this the fourth industrial revolution? Is it the second digital revolution? And most importantly, the revolution of what? Like, what words should we put when we describe that revolution? Is that the always connected revolution? Is it the uh, everything is about you is being recorded and analyzed revolution? The rise of the machines? The fact is that we don't know. But we d what we do know is this. When we were here at the end of the third revolution, uh, we were at the summit of that evolutional stage, right? So we had experience, we had the tools, we had best practices, we had standards, we had white papers, we knew how to deal with stuff. When we're here, when we're entering the new age, we have immense opportunities, but no experience. So our tools are inaccurate and our intuitions are probably wrong. Another interesting thing to note about these revolutions is that it's very easy to focus on the winners, the stuff that we got, but there were also losers in each of these steps. 
So the first revolution, the, the big losers were what was called the landed nobility. So the people who were rich at the time were rich because they owned a lot of land. And that was because it was impossible to increase the output of any given square meter of land. So the only way to get rich was by owning more land. So that's when you had all these like big invasion wars where you try to expand the territory of your country. You had colonialism. Uh, in, oh, uh, sorry, and, and when, when we go to, to, the, um, to mechanical production, all of a sudden, it doesn't matter how much land you have, it matters what you do with it. So if you put up a factory, you can make a lot of money, which meant that these guys started falling off. And now you can see, if you look at the, the British nobility today, they have to rent out their castles to tourists in order to be able to pay for them. So they lost power here. Uh, in the second revolution, there were also some losers. So um, it's hard to see now, but th the thing that's behind the sign there, that's a gas-powered radio. Because the gas companies tried to get people to not go on the electric, as they called it. So they started building all these like um, refrigerators and radios and stuff that were powered by gas because you don't need electricity. And of course it didn't work, or people didn't want it. The second one is more uh, interesting. Uh, there's a company called the Knickerbocker Ice and Coal Company that basically ruled the greater New York area in, uh, at this time. Uh, they said that they weren't uh, afraid of the electricity because people would always want the, the personal service that the Iceman brought. And of course, they failed and they went bankrupt. But the really interesting thing about them was that several years later, I think it was like 20 years later, was the first time that any uh, measure of logistics that corresponded to what they had was recreated. So if they had realized that they were in the logistics business, not the ice business, they could have kept prospering, but they didn't and they failed. And then we have the third revolution and you know the, fa the, the losers of this one is basically anyone who provides any sort of analog solution, technolo technology or distribution. So why is this? Why is it that so many companies die when technology changes? Well, I think that one of the fundamentals of these technological revolutions is that they change the natural quanta, the natural size of what's reasonable. So uh, in, the, um, in the industrial age, the natural size of news was a newspaper. Now the natural size of news is a news flash. So papers are dying. Let's look at another example that applies now. So Scania is a big Swedish uh, truck manufacturer. Um, this is their current truck and this is their vision of the future. I think they're wrong. Why? Well, let's have a look at another Swedish company. This is a Swedish startup that's called Einride. This is um, an electric uh, autonomous lorry that's actually on Swedish roads today. And the interesting to th thing to note about it, except for the fact that it doesn't have uh, anywhere for a driver to sit, is that it's smaller. Now, why is it smaller? Well, that's because the cost of a truck is largely driven by the cost of the driver. So you need a big truck so you can pay for the driver. If you remove the driver, you don't need a big truck. You can have lots of trucks. You can run lots of transports. They don't need to be big. The size changes with technology. Um, one of the most famous Swedish authors is, was a guy called August Strindberg. And uh, we were... Uh, visiting his, his apartment uh, with, with my company because we used to work just across the street from there. And this is was where his apartment was. And that's the elevator in that house. And they told us about how when he moved in there, he, he lived on the top floor, it's a really nice apartment. Um, when he moved in there, uh, he had this moving in party. And then s they sent out all these invitations. And all, all the invitations said, there is an elevator in the house. Now, why did it say that? Well, it was because he didn't want people to think that he's suddenly gotten poor. Because only poor people lived on the top floor. Because 
it was a long way to the yard and the potty. And you had to walk up all the stairs. And then comes the elevator. And the entire structure of property values flips. All of a sudden, the top floor is the most expensive, and the bottom floor is the cheapest. So technological change is not about technology. It's about sociology and economy. Let's have a look at the self-driving car again. This was uh, sometime in the 50s when people tried to imagine what a self-driving car would be. I don't think this, this is a good illustration because they focus on the wrong thing. Uh, we tried to uh, illustrate the effects of self-driving cars and we ended up with this. So this is a map of property values in Gothenburg because it turns out that the property values are directly correlated to how close they are to public transportation. Now, if you have autonomous vehicles that you can just call with your phone, you can expect that thing to change. So we basically said, how much faster would you move from this address given that you're in a car with no traffic? And we recalculated an index and said, okay, so the red ones are the properties that are gonna uh, lose value and the green ones are gonna gain value. Another way to illustrate autonomous vehicles is this. I was talking to a woman who said, if we had autonomous vehicles, I wouldn't be alive today because I had a, tr uh, a heart transplant and my heart came from a person who died in traffic. So transplants are mainly done uh, with organs that come from people who die in traffic because that's when young and healthy people die. That's where we get all our organs. So autonomous vehicles means we need to hurry up and manufacture more bionic organs. That's what technolo technological change looks like. Um, but there's also another thing that happens when we do this. So if you're suddenly starting to accept the fact that bionic organs becomes more and more of a normal thing, so for us this is new and sort of scary, for the young generation, it's kind of cool. But the next genera generation after that will consider that completely normal. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if my grandchildren start replacing limbs. Because that's what happens when something becomes normal. You start asking, what if? So then we enter the post-human age. Okay, let's have a look at the second shift. Human civilization has gone through some stages. Uh, you might think that history starts with the birth of the human. It does not. History started around uh, 5,500 to 5,300 BC. Because history is defined as uh, the period of time where we had the written language. Before that is the prehistoric period. So what happened when we uh, invented the written language was that we uh, were able to expand our tribes. Our tribes were capped around 50 people before that. But with the possibility of storing information and transferring information, you could expand the tribes. So we got larger tribes, to up to 150 people and more. Then we entered the modern period. Now the modern period starts roughly 1440. AD, and it starts with a printing press. So now we go from distribution of information to mass distribution of information. Again, this enables us to store more information, di distribute it more uh, effectively, and again, we can increase our tribes. So we go from these like small states into larger nation states. The countries are basically born because you can administer larger areas. And now we're going into the third stage. So this is Tim Berners-Lee. In 1989, he proposed what became the World Wide Web. So what is the World Wide Web? Well, it's a way of distributing information even faster and in larger quantities than before. But it's also interesting to note that 
um, HTTP consists of a set of verbs. Now, these are the things that you can do with HTTP. So the Gutenberg press was basically one post and the rest were gets. That was it. Now we can do posts and gets all the time and we can do patches. Basically what this means is that we can not only spread information, we can discuss information and we can collaborate on information. And a sort of supercharge of this is the pull request. So not only can I listen to your idea, and I, not only can I listen to it and tell you what I th think could be better, I could actually give you a proposition of how to make it better. So we're going from standing on the shoulders of giants to constantly climbing the shoulders of each other. It's sort of like Australian football where you're suddenly two meters above the ground. But this changes us. This way of communicating changes how we as humans behave and perceive the world. We create new values. So we start moving from the nuclear family, which was like the, the, the center of, um, of who you were, into more of tribal communities. We, uh, we change our identity. We used to have a concentric identity. There was... Um, a Swedish prime minister who was called Carl Bildt, he wrote his memoirs and he called them Hallending Svensk Europea, which means basically the county, the country, and Europe. These were his, his identities. So you have this like concentric identity that expands. Now, if I look at my daughter, she has hyper local or global. She's basically the area where she lives. That's the first step. The second step is the globe. There is no point to draw any line around Stockholm or the county that she lives in or around Sweden for that matter. She has friends who moved to the States. And they keep hanging out. There are no borders in Snapchat. So you're super local and then it's just the rest. So the identity changes. And it does so because we go from a, a company that's based on proximity. Like I talk to you because you're close to me. And now I start talking to people because they're interesting. So that's actually why I presented myself by showing you what I do and what I like and what I watch on YouTube. And I think that a lot of you looked at that and you picked up on something and you went, okay, I do that part too. I do that part too. Now we have a connection. We, got, we could hang out in that subject, even if we don't hang out in anything else. But this also creates bubbles. Because when you're talking to the person that just happens to stand next to you, you get perspectives that you don't get when you always hang out with your peers, with other nerds, and talk about programming. It's easy to think that the world consists entirely of programmers. It doesn't. It would be great. But it doesn't. So this is something that we're just now learning. How do, we, uh, how do we cope with people who are different if we constantly hang out with people who are similar in some aspect? This also gives rise to what's called the netocrat. So instead of uh, your value being defined of, um, by what you know, it gets more and more defined by who you know. Um, these are two Swedish philosophers called Alexander Baden and Jan Söderqvist. They wrote this book, The Netocrats, at the end of the 90s. They were basically watching the, the internet and the web rising, and they posed that this will change society fundamentally. We will move past the capitalist system because you have to remember the capitalist system is direct product of industrialism. Before that, we were in the feudal system. So we got from the feudal system to the capitalist system. And now we're leaving that behind and going into a new economic system. But what doesn't change is that we, we will still have an upper class and a lower class. It used to be the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, if you... Um, uh, if you've read any Marx, 
Now we're moving in to a new system with the netocracy and the uh, consum uh, consumptariat the producers of information and value, and the consumers of information and value. So you have the YouTubers who are unpacking their mascara, who are forming the new netocracy, and the ha you have the consumptariat who just blindly watch them and go buy that mascara. It also marks the death of the individual. What do I mean by that? Well, we used to assume that all ideas were created by individuals. I am an individual, I have ideas, I create them, I present them, you perceive them, and I experience some sort of value. What happens when we start collaborating is that we move the value from the nodes into the vertices. The ideas aren't spawned by my brain, it's spawned by my meeting with other people, with, in my collaboration with other people. So what does that mean? Well, it means that my value will not emanate from how strong I am as a node. It will be determined how, by how close I am to the center of the social graph. That's how I increase my value. So if you meet more people, and you connect more people, you increase your value on the market. Because it's not about your brain, it's about your brain's interaction with other brains, it's the vertices. Now this is not entirely new, but it's in the, the, the value of it has increased by, an or, by orders of magnitude. So the third shift then, evolutionary jumps. So how many evolutionary jumps have we as humanity had? Well, it's basically one. Somewhere around 300,000 years, we get Homo sapiens sapiens, the thinking man. And that's it. Or is it? Is there a next step? Well, some people would say that AGI is the next step, the, the artificial general intelligence. Uh, and that could be cool or scary or both, but it seems pretty far off. Um, Although, I will say that it's, it's actually not that hard to determine how far off it is, because uh, we're really, really bad with intuition when it comes to exponential change. So, let me ask you a question. If we were to build a spaceship that could accelerate constantly at 1G, now a Tesla 100P can accelerate at 1.1G. So it's slightly less than a sports car, okay? But it does so constantly. Now, if we were to use that vehicle to go, we, were, we accelerate halfway to Mars, and then we decelerate at 1G, the other half, how long would it take to reach Mars? It's actually three days. So you were really close. Um, if we don't slow down, but we keep accelerating, and just keep heading for Jupiter, we'll be there in four and a half days. So it's, it's hard to intuit about exponential growth. And let's look at another example of what this means. So we have Moore's law. Moore's law is a description of exponential growth, a constant doubling of the number of um, transistors on a processor. What's the effect of that? Well, we had, in 1946, we, we get the, basically the first digital computer, the ENIAC. Uh, 50 years later, IBM's Deep Blue beats Kasparov at chess. We jump forward, what is it, um, 15 years? And IBM's Watson wins Jeopardy over three uh, national champions. And then just five more years before Google's AlphaGo beats Lee Sedol at Go. Now, Go is an interesting game. It's been around for ages, and, and it's been used in Japan uh, not, not primarily as a game, but as, as a tool of philosophy, as a tool for understanding nature and humanity. So people are being trained as Go players from very young ages. So beating a human at Go is, is quite an impressive feat. But even more impre impressive is that 
after uh, AlphaGo uh, beat Lee Sedol, it kept playing. And Go players started studying AlphaGo to learn more about the game. And just a year after, uh, another ch uh, champion of Go called Ni Wei Ping said this. He said that Go is not as simple as we thought. There is still huge room for we humans to explore. Either AlphaGo or Master, it's sent by the Go god to guide humans. To quote another person, now if you begin to feel an intense and crushing feeling of religious terror at the concept, don't be alarmed. That indicates only that you are still sane. That's said by Wally Weaver in The Watchmen. So things are moving faster than we think. But I still would not argue that AGI is the next evolutional step. I would say that the next evolutional step is the augmented human. It's basically a new species. So what do I mean by that? Well, this person and this person are widely different. Because with my phone, I have access to basically all human knowledge. I can communicate over vast instances and I don't get lost. Without the phone, I can't do any of that. I think that's why we're so terrified about that red battery symbol, because it actually diminishes us as humans. And to, it's like, it, it, it can be hard to sort of grasp the, the implications of something like this, but I think that sometimes when you try to figure out where something is heading, you can use language to tell you. So an interesting thing about language is that we, we constantly invent new words, but we don't invent just any words. We invent words for anomalies because normal things need no description, right? So example of anomalies, um, we got store-bought bread. When everyone was making their own bread, suddenly you could buy it in the store, we got store-bought bread. A few years later, we get homemade, home-baked. That word did not exist before. It tells us that the, the default has shifted. Now the anomaly is making the bread yourself. Digital cameras don't exist anymore. Now we have analog cameras because those are the anomaly. IRL used to be described as when you're not on the internet, the real life. Now that transformed into AFK. You're just away from keyboard. And a new trending word that's starting to replace AFK is this. Hello, the meat world. So you have the real life and then you have the meat world. And it's funny to see what happens when we start to look at it this way, because all of a sudden, what are you going to do in the meat world? I mean, it's not like you can work there. You can't do anything of significance. So you start playing. So you start like shutting off entire cities to have these like silly color runs and stuff. Why? Because the meat world is now a playground. It's not where we do any serious work. Um, so what does this all mean? How can we respond to such a seismic shift? Well, I have five tips to give you. The first of them is that you need to accept the realities of dealing with complexity because more and more of the things we face are complex now. That comes from the fact that we're at the start of a new revolution, which means that we don't yet understand anything. So everything is complex. What does complex mean? Well, according to, sorry, I should say this is uh, Welsh. So of course it's pronounced Kenevan, as you can see. So according to Kenevan, uh, there are basically four distinct types of problems that you can encounter. The first one is called the obvious problems. Obvious problems are problems where the cause and effect relationship is perceivable. You know what causes what. It's predictable and you can do it over and over again. That's where we have best practices. Uh, so basically what you do is you sense what's going on, you categorize that and then you respond. It's really simple. The second part is the complicated part. This is like designing an airplane. So you can still 
um, determine the relationships between, between cause and effect, but you need to do a pre-study. You need to gather the data. You need to analyze it. So you sense, you analyze, and you respond. You have good practices, but there is no one best practice. Complex problems are problems where the cause and effect relationship are observable only in retrospect. It's basically the, what happens if I press this button? I'll just press it and see what happens. Oh, it blew up. That was funny. Most of the things we do are like this. When you're saying, okay, let's automate this workflow in this organization, what's going to happen? Well, we don't know. Like, I remember when, when the first, when, when Nokia released their first phone that had Java on it, a friend of mine said, oh my God, do you realize what that means? It means that we're going to be able to build programs. So you're going to have a button that you just press and a taxi will come and pick you up. Seemed all right. What he couldn't foresee was that it would mean that you would have electric scooters all over the city. Because the cause and effect are observable uh, after the fact. And it's non-repeatable. So what you need to do is you need to try something. You need to probe it. And then you can sense it and analyze it. And then you can respond. This is why estimations fail all the time, because we no don't know what we're doing, and we shouldn't know what we're doing. Because if we do know what we're doing, we're back in the obvious area. And the obvious area is being shipped off to China and Vietnam and Bangladesh for basic manufacturing. And then we have the fourth quadrant, which is the chaotic. This is uh, like the crises when, when your system gets hacked or something and you ha need to respond the first thing you do. Like the building is on fire, so you get out, you put the fire out, then you find out what's caused it. Lesson number two, study the ants. So in this world of complexity, where we're sensing, we're probing, we're, we're uh, going back and forth and trying to figure out what, what we're supposed to do, I would say that what we need to stop doing is just pointing in the direction and start going there. We should start behaving like the ants. Because what happens when an ant finds food is that it starts emitting um, uh, a signal substance. It still has no idea where it's going. So it's just like moving around and sort of slowly trying to approach the, their home, and it will run into other ants. And they will go, oh, there is food somewhere? That's cool. So they start emitting this substance while they follow the first ant substance, the, the, the signal. And what happens is that when you try to follow like this winding path, you sort of tend to smooth out the winds. And as more and more ants join, you get these straight, uh, straight ant paths. Um, Douglas Adams wrote about a detective who was called Dirk Gently, who always, when he didn't know where he was going, he always started following someone who looked like they knew what they were doing, which never ever brought him to where he wanted to go, but always where he should be. So, you, you, um, if you watch what's going on, the people around you don't need to have the answers. But the, if, if there is a shred of answer there, try to follow them and try to emit the same signal yourselves. Because together we can create that amp path that actually leads us into the right place. It just takes more time. Number three, refuse to do bullshit jobs. Uh, this is a book that was uh, written in 2018 by uh, anthropologist David Graeber. It was based on an essay that he wrote in 2013. And it's basically um, based on a, an assumption that John Maynard Keynes had back in the 30s when he looked at industrial revolution. And he said, well, this is going to mean that we're going to have a 15-hour work week. And it turned out that we don't. We still have a 40-hour work week. So the, 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 the question that he asked was, like, what are we doing with all this time? And he said that the problem is that we fill all that time with bullshit jobs. It's not shit jobs. It's not that they're bad. It's that they're pointless. They're meaningless and often destructive. So he basically um, uh, said that there are five groups of, of bullshit jobs. You have the flunkies. 
the ones that make their superiors feel important, like the, uh, the receptionists, administrative assistants, door attendants, and so forth. You have the goons, the ones who act aggressively uh, on behalf of their employers. So lobbyists, corporate lawyers, telemarketers, public relations. Uh, the duct tapers, that's us. <laughs> that lessen the effects of what should have been a preventable problem, like patching faulty code that was shoddily written, or, or people at airports who are there to basically calm down the passengers because they lost their bags. Um, You've got the box tickers. You probably have those in your teams as well. So those, those are the ones who use paperwork and gestures as a proxy for action. So you have the rituals that you do instead of doing actual valuable stuff. So like performance managers, in-house magazine journalists, leisure coordinators, stuff like that. And then the taskmasters, the ones who manage or more often create extra work for those who don't need it. So I'm talking about middle management, leadership professionals, stuff like that. Now the problem is if you accept doing bullshit jobs, it will prevent you from reaping the benefits of this new age. And the same thing happens if you accept being surrounded by people who do bullshit jobs. And I know that you all know what a bullshit job is when you see one, but you need to start reacting. Lesson number four, avoid getting stuck in static conflict. So what is that? Well, like I was talking about these, these big things happening. Uh, I, I like to sort of summarize them as global mega trends. So the megatrends of digitalization, netocracy, post-humanity. And then you have the counter movements that might look like trends, but they're not. They're reactions. So, so you have uh, these trends. The foundation of these trends are dynamic movement, right? Something is happening. Something is going somewhere. What happens when something starts going somewhere is that someone gets angry. Every movement, movement has its critics. And the critics will step off and say, this is bullshit. I don't like this. What happens then is that some people on the other side will step off as well. So the first ones who stepped off, they're the ones that don't like the direction the movement is going. They don't approve of it. The second ones don't approve of the guys who stepped off. And what these two groups are doing now is that they're pushing each other further and further apart by raising their voices more and more and more and fighting more and more loudly. So you have these counter movements of digitalization, which leads to the, the, the death of the nation because of the shifting identities. So of course we have a rise in nationalism. It's a counter movement. The netocracy and the death of the individual, of course we have a counter movement. You have the postmodern left, you have the identitarian right. The post-humanity and the successions of the Homo sapiens sapiens, well, you can just look at this religiousness that comes around nature nowadays, or the anti-vaxxer movement. And on the other side, you have the, the, the sort of religious AI people. They're like, oh, it's, it's almost here. Everything is going gonna, gonna to change tomorrow. And they're fighting it out. So you have these fights, and they're just pushing each other further and further apart and forget to move forward. Because the point is that you shouldn't be fighting those guys. You should continue the movement. So let me just show you an example of that, which is just brilliant. It was yesterday or the day before that. So this happens, okay? Greta Thunberg has been talking for the UN. Donald Trump throws shade on her and says she seems like a very happy young girl looking forward to a bright and wonderful future. So nice to see. Now, she, the, the Twitter, Twitters went, went apeshit. Everyone was screaming at each other. Everyone was angry. What she did was she um, just updated her Twitter bio and then went on to have a meeting with Angela Merkel instead. <laughs> so that's how you do it. Don't get stuck in the fight. Don't get provoked. You don't need them. Keep the movement going forward. Don't get stuck in that static conflict. And number five, share. 
always share. Share your ideas, share your values, share your contacts. If you know someone who is awesome and another person who is awesome and they haven't met, introduce them to each other. If you're talking to someone and a friend walks by, introduce them to each other. The more vertices you create, the more value will be created in that area. And the more people that you introduce to each other, the, f the closer to the center of the social graph you will move. So, like, don't hold your ideas in. Try to get more people to agree with them. Be a netocrat, not a consumer. Of course, and finally, this is hard. Mistakes will be made. But the way to, uh, to handle the fact that you know that you're going to make mistakes is by reevaluating how you make your choices. So instead of looking at how much does it cost me to choose this path, you should look at how, does mu how much does it cost me to turn back. It's not the nominal cost of implementation, it's minimal cost of change that should guide your decisions. Because then it doesn't matter, or at least you minimize the cost of being wrong, because you're going to be wrong a lot. And that's why the future is awesome. Thank you. I was actually not only on time, I was under time. So we have eight minutes, nine minutes, if you have any questions. Yep. <laughs> okay, so what books can I suggest? Well, um, um, firstly, I would say that, that um, the the, the sort of the, the talk is actually uh, like a mishmash of ideas and, and stuff, but I would say that a good place to start is actually The Netocrats is a really good book to start with. Um, the other books in that is called The Futuritica Trilogy. They're interested in well as well as The Global Empire and The Body Machines. Um, they're a bit harder to read, so uh, it's okay to give up after The Netocrats. <laughs> um, also, something that's not, it's, it's not directly related to this, but, but something that's influenced me deeply when thinking about these things is, is um, uh, the book that Dylan mentioned yesterday, Gödel Escherbach, which is basically like, if you want to understand humanity and language and maths, you need to read Gödel Escherbach. I need to read like five or six times before you get it, because it's, <laughs> it's insane. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like so many things that I don't know. I, I, I think that like, like a lot of things, uh, w when I try to just like make sense of what, where we're going is I actually talk to my daughter because she's a digital native and I'm a digital immigrant. Uh, like I was eight when I got my first computer. Sorry. Yeah, you were 14, yeah. No, but, but no so, so it's like, um, it, it's really interesting to see how, how kids use um, digital media because it's different. Um, and that's, f for me, that's a way to sort of try to understand what the difference is and then I can sort of get a vector from there and try to extrapolate. Uh, and there's always, th th a good thing to do is always assume that you're an idiot and that you're wrong. <laughs> because that, that's like, th there are so many interesting thoughts that, that occur when you just say, okay, this is probably because I'm an idiot and I'm wrong. What if blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like the, the knee-jerk reaction, just throw that away and see what happens if you think that like, oh, electric scooters are horrible, but what if I'm an idiot and I'm wrong? What if electric scooters are really cool? Ah, what happens then? So, yeah. Yeah. I have a, a question going with uh, Berkshire. I don't know if you're going to read it or going to. And what do you think about the, the Philip Bocket and the post-industrial revolution trying to also 
the final statement is going to change. Do you believe in finance of people in something like basic income, in something like cryptocurrency, or do you believe in the future of financial situation? Of so, so the, what, what would be the future of the financial situation? Um, that, that's almost a talk in and of itself. I actually gave such a talk for, for uh, CFOs of major European companies in Frankfurt in November last year. Um, I think that um, I think that uh, cryptocurrencies could actually be a thing. Um, it's, it's interesting to note if you look at all these like shifts in technology, they've also been coupled with shifts in, in economic systems and um, and also in how we treat uh, stuff like money. So we used to had have the, um, uh, the gold standard and then that crashed and we got the Bretton Woods system and the Bretton Woods system crashed and now we got floating, uh, um, um, what is it called? Like um, flo uh, floating currencies. And so I would say that if we have like a deep financial crisis with a very weak Euro and uh, a lessened um, trust in the institutions. I could totally see that being the like the, the start of, of cryptocurrencies taking over. Uh, when it comes to basic income, um, I think that it's a nice idea. I'm not sure that it's going to be possible to implement that in the way that we think, because I'm not sure that the states are going to be what they are. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it's like an interesting question. Like, do, will, will automation kill jobs or will automation just kill current jobs? Because like, okay, so all the truck drivers are going to be out of jobs. We know that. It's going to happen. Not tomorrow, not next year, but it's going to happen. But the thing was... We already lost all the people who were shoveling coal into coal engines. They lost their jobs and like it didn't affect the economy or humanity as a whole. It affected people who were used to shoveling coal. So, uh, I mean, we're going to have a lot more people who are like dog hair stylists and uh, stuff like that. Because, because like every time that you satisfy a need, you, you tend to find a new one. So I'm not actually sure that we're going to get rid of jobs. But I think that we're going to change how we uh, um, how we value jobs, because if 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 the way to make money is to be at the center of the social graph, what is to say that you don't get rid of money eventually and just focus on the graph? Mm -hmm. So, so the question is, um, uh, don't you think that there is a, um, a danger of us losing central skills as we become these like augmented superhumans and then when everything goes to shit, we don't know how to do that anymore? Uh, yes, uh, that is definitely true. Uh, I will say though, uh, it doesn't change the fact that it's going to happen because whether you like it or not, it's not the issue. It's going to happen and it's already happened. Like people are crap at, finding the true north by looking at the growth of, on trees. They used to use a compass and now they use the phone. So it's always been like that. Um, it's, uh, if you haven't read it, you should read World War Z. It's a really interesting zombie novel, but they talk about a lot about what happens to society when, when everything breaks down. And one thing that happens in Los Angeles is that they classify people from A to F depending on how useless they are. So A are really useful and F are really useless. And A is uh, the gardeners and uh, um, like people who take care of the stuff for the rich people. They are now A people. And F people are people like uh, actors and corporate lawyers, and basically the people who are rich in Los Angeles today. 
So it sort of flips the social structure because different things get useful. Um, so yes, that is a danger. Um, and I think that's something that's interesting to think about for myself, but it will not in any way, shape or form uh, prevent it from happening because it's always happened. Anything more? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>